Okay, so just like yesterday, when we talked about um, magnetic fields and we looked at the right-hand rules and we tried to determine all these great things, um, sometimes it really helps to have a little bit of time um, in person to practice these things, and, and we certainly will do that again today because we're going to introduce the third right-hand rule today. But the motor principle really talks about the underlying physics idea for why a motor works. And to be very, um, to be very, very to the point, when you run an electric current in a wire through a magnetic field, that, that wire feels a force, okay? And that force is going to help us to do things because, of course, you know if there's a force, then that means that there could be an acceleration, and if there's an acceleration, then there could be movement, and there could be motion, and that's exactly what happens in a motor, is that we run a current through a coil, and we set that coil inside of a magnetic field, and there's a force that acts on that coil, and so the current moves and um, the coils move and, and we get this great spinning action. And you're going to see this tomorrow um, or the next day whenever we build uh, our motors together in the, in the motor lab. So uh, the motor principle basically involves the interaction of two magnetic fields and that's what happens. So um, I'm going to run a current through one wire and that's going to create a magnetic field and I'm going to stick that into another magnetic field and those two magnetic fields are going to do funny things with each other. Sometimes they're going to attract each other. Sometimes they're going to repel each other. <coughs> and so if we look at some experiments on conductors, and specifically conductors that are sitting inside magnetic fields, we kind of get some of these observations. And really, for the most part, right now in grade 11, these observations aren't really important. Um, and it, you certainly, I would never ask you to memorize these, but... Basically, there's a couple of these that are that are good, so we'll kind of go through these. How big the magnetic force is, because remember we said this wire is going to feel a force. Okay, so how big that force is is really proportional to the current and to the length of the conductor. So a longer conductor, you're going to have more of a force, and if you put more current through it, you're going to have more of a force. Okay, so that's the first thing we need to know. Um, also, again, I've got a coil, and I'm putting it. I'm putting a current into a magnetic field, and so the magnitude and the direction of this force are very dependent on the magnitude and direction of the current and the magnetic field. So we saw up here that the force is important that we know about the current. Well, the force is also important that we know information about the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field. Okay. Um, when the current is parallel to the magnetic force, to the magnetic field, the force is zero. And the magnetic force is always perpendicular to both of these two things, current and magnetic field. Okay? So again, these right here and memorizing these aren't super important. What all these things tell us, though, is they tell us, here's a little diagram of a current going through, cutting through a magnetic field. Okay, all of these things together tell us something very cool, and that's that the force on that wire, and you saw that wire cutting through that magnetic field, the force is equal to the current times the length of the wire times the magnetic field, okay, and that, that's how big the force is, and um, just so that you know, this magnetic field right here is measured in Tesla, okay, so one Tesla, it's a, it's a SI unit. A derived unit just like the ampere or the ohm or the volt okay um, force here is still measured in newtons no problem and to discover the direction of this force because after all force is a vector we have another right hand rule and so what we do is to determine the direction of the force we place our thumb in the direction of the conventional current flow you put your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field from north to the south. Magnetic fields always point to the south. And your palm will indicate the direction of the force. So here's a little diagram. This is from your textbook. And you can see that in this case, the magnetic force would be up. Okay, so here's a little example um, of a current running through a magnetic field and the force that it's going to feel. Okay, so. Here's a little diagram. We've got a wire and it's carrying a current of 10 amps. It's suspended between a house and the garage, which is five meters away. 
Okay, so there's 10 amps that are running through this current, this, this wire, and this wire happens to be 5 meters long. Okay, the Earth's magnetic field at this point is straight downwards. It's directed straight down, and it has a value of 5.0 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. What is the magnitude and the direction of the force that's acting on this wire? All right, so there's two parts of this that we need to do. We first work out the magnitude, and then we'll use a right-hand rule to figure out the direction. And here we go. We know that the magnitude of the force that acts on this wire is the current times the length times the magnetic field. And if I substitute these three things in, one, two, three, I come up with a very small force, especially small considering how much gravity would be acting on this, 0 0.0025 newtons. Now, last but not least, um, in this problem is that we're going to use the right hand rule number three so let's put our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field which would be downwards spin your hand around so that your thumb is pointed in the direction of the current and which way does your palm face because right now it should be facing into the screen or into the page however you want to look at this and so basically what we have from right hand rule number three is that this force that we just calculated here is directed into the page. And because force is a vector, it needs to have a magnitude which we found up here and a direction which we found here. Okay? So that's basically how we do these. Now, let's make the extension to how motors work. Simply put, two magnetic fields interact with one another to create this force. And that's what we've been calculating. And now that we know that magnets can be created and controlled through current electricity, we can cre create and control electromagnetic forces. So Michael Faraday, a uh, renowned physicist, was one of the first scientists to use this idea, and he created the first electric motor. Okay, So here is the DC motor. It's a direct current motor, Okay, so it's different than an alternating current motor. We won't handle those until grade 12, but here the direct current motor is one of the most important applications of electromagnetism. Okay, so this is the diagram that we've taken from your textbook, and, and it's explained very, very well in your textbook. But what happens is, is that you've got these things right here, and bear with me here, because I'm going to use the mouse to kind of point to where these things are. So here you got a big north and a big and a big south over here. So these two things create like a huge permanent magnet, okay? around this motor. And inside of this big magnetic field you've got this little coil that wraps around and you've got this very fancy device up here called a commutator. Anyways, if we can run current from a battery through this coil, then of course the current flowing this through this coil sets up a magnetic field like this. Sometimes this magnetic field would be aligned with this big external magnetic field. Sometimes it would be disaligned with the big external magnetic field. And what ends up happening is, if you set this on an axis, is that this magnetic field, or this little um, um, coil in here, will rotate. Because whenever the north and the south are disaligned with the magnet that's in here, then you get an opposing force and it wants to shoot it around. And if you've got a magnetic field that's aligned, then it wants to realign itself with this magnetic field. So you get this spinning effect. And you, you'll see, you see this if you look up um, YouTube in any little simple DC motor, and you'll see exactly what this means. Okay, And we're going to build these um, tomorrow in class or, or the next day in class. We're going we're gonna to have an opportunity to build our own DC motor. But basically, these are some of the parts, and these are really important. So we've talked about the external magnetic field. You need to have a loop. Right, so a system of a system of loops right here. So all these coils that are going to be looped around some central axis. You need a brush, which is up here. These are brushes. These things right here are brushes. You need a commutator, and I'm going to explain what the commutator is for. And you need some external power source, which is like a battery. Okay. So this in here, this brush and commutator um, system, is a very fancy way of making sure that we don't get these wires in here because of course if we're going to send current through this coil these wires need to be connected but they can't get all twisted up if this thing's going to spin like a motor does so we need to think about some way of connecting the electricity 
so that the wires don't get all twisted and turned. And the way that we do that is that we use a commutator and a brush so that as this commutator spins, it doesn't tangle the wires, but basically it touches the brushes and the whole commutator system spins like this. And we're going to go over the operation right now. So it's basically described in these steps. First of all, current flows into the root loop. Okay, into the coil in the middle, current flows in. And this causes a force because of the motor principle. And that force causes this loop to rotate. And basically, the loop rotates until there's a split in the commutator. Until, of course, there's a split in that little ring. It's like, a, it's like two little rings. And the current stops flowing. But because, because the loop is already rotating, inertia keeps it going. Until it, of course, continues to rotate until it comes in contact with the commutator again. But now the loop is inverted. And the forces cause it to spin again but in with another, basically with another kick. Okay, and then we basically repeat this. And you will see this in great detail when we actually do this. It's really helpful. If right now, if you're a little bit unsure about these things, go and take a look. There's, there's a YouTube video out there that will take you through kind of some of these steps and just do a YouTube search for DC, um, DC motor or simple DC motor. And, and you'll see exactly how this works. And, and this will become a lot more clear.